the title of this talk is uh, Tools of the Trade for Modern ISOs or CSOs. Uh, there is a kind of, uh, I mean, story behind the talk. Uh, that is, last year in about um, something like August, uh, last year I, I was for several reasons, I was quite often in Austria. And uh, I have some contacts to, to a um, certain university in Austria, and they approached me like, um, uh, okay, you know, um, uh, can you, we have a, um, a curriculum for information security management. Um, within that curriculum, can you provide, a, a, say, a free day a workshop on, um, say, uh, roles and tasks and challenges and whatever of uh, ISOs. Um, uh, I said, well, I could probably do that as my, a lot of my work includes serving as a kind of, um, I call it uh, insinuator, so um, to, uh, to ISOs to some degree. I, uh, there was um, several ISOs I consult to on a very ongoing basis, like um, uh, every once in some, some weeks, uh, reviewing documents or providing advice. Um, there is another environment where I pretty much uh, every week I get something on my desk, like, um, what's your opinion on this? Uh, can you have a look at, on, at this? So I know, say, the world of ISOs, what I think quite well. So I, I answered, yes, I, I could probably do that and started discussing, say, the potential contents of such an, a uh, curriculum um, on a personal level, mainly with um, my old friend Brian Fry, who gave yesterday's talk on uh, outsourcing security and who is the master of the Peckle Wars. And he then came around, um, I mean, he's organizing another event in the, in the US, and uh, he uh, said, oh, listen, um, once you have to prepare the stuff anyway, what about giving a keynote on this at uh, the US conference? Uh, I agreed, and what you will see today is uh, that exact keynote. So compared to other presentations I've been giving in the past, which usually had some more or less technical content or some, um, yeah, let's say some, some structure and uh, some valuable stuff that was transported, this one might be a bit different. It was intended to be a keynote. Uh, which uh, usually means uh, it should be uh, a bit thought-provoking, not too technical, not too overloaded with stuff. And after I'd done this, I was um, approached several times when I discussed this with um, ISOs or other colleagues at some level, uh, like, oh, could you give this again? And uh, so Troopers, obviously, is an opportunity to give this again. It's the exact uh, same stuff. No modification since, as the message uh, has what I think stayed more or less the same. And um, I put it in the afternoon of the second day, as usually that uh, people get more relaxed. And uh, I mean, you can't hold the tension of uh, taking high level input uh, in a foreign language for two days. Uh, so it seemed um, having this in the afternoon of the second day um, might be an idea. So enough said, do not expect um, uh, the same level of technical uh, accuracy that maybe other presentations I gave in the past had. I'll skip this, uh, I'll skip this, this is the block. Um, there are uh, mainly three pieces in this talk. That is, I'll discuss, uh, say, the tasks and challenges, be the past tasks or the current or those uh, that I see in the future. Of an ISO, I'll um, discuss, uh, say, what, what is the role of an ISO within an organization, as I think this has changed, and I will spice it up with some references to movies. Uh, from what I get, many of you are mainly, say, in the, the same age uh, as I am. We are no more 22-year-old uh, um, uh, students, so you might know some of the movies. Um, 
uh, there are, might be parts of the audience that are not being present here uh, who have no idea oh, what, what kind of movie is that. So there is uh, some emotional value in the talk, uh, which might even stimulate you. Ah, yeah, yeah, at that time, um, when, I, when I was young, I watched that movie. Uh, the intended audience, obviously, is, is ISOs. That is, I, I want to kind of, I wouldn't even say I have a message to deliver. Uh, I'd say I l like to uh, make your thoughts going um, about your role within your organization and the way uh, you, you fulfill your daily task and um, maybe uh, get some ideas uh, what could be uh, ways to, uh, to consider in the, or elements to consider in the future. An ISO's task, um, I, when, when preparing this talk, uh, what I did was uh, I uh, contacted some ISOs uh, that I uh, know on a um, slightly personal level, like, okay, um, uh, I'm facing the, uh, the task of uh, preparing a talk. Um, what, from your f perspective, are the ma five main responsibilities? Uh, of an ISO, and um, I collected those, I put those together, and those are the five that are mainly, uh, that were the, the, uh, with the most, um, uh, say, points, like uh, at number of citations. Uh, that is uh, long-term uh, security strategy, uh, creation of policies and guidelines, uh, risk assessment, um, analysis of security incidents, and uh, taking care of compliance. This is a pretty common, I'd say, description of what an ISO uh, usually does. What is interesting about this is uh, this is heavily, uh, say, circulated around the, let's say, security space, which might not be surprising given ISO stands for Information Security Officer. So obviously this person has to deal with security. Sure, admit it. Uh, still, uh, when Michael Tooman introduced himself as the head of um, application security and uh, information security officer at ERNW. I was tempted to add that at the time when I uh, say gave him the responsibility, the role of being the uh, ISO, the understanding of an ISO was, uh, okay, this person has to be uh, somebody like a, a terrier, you understand? I, I mean, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is a correct translation into English, like a bulldog. Uh, somebody who is uh, paranoid about security, and by being paranoid um, about security, balances out business, forgetting about security. So you need a, a bulldog on this side uh, to, uh, to have a, say, uh, balance within the overall organization. This was an, a very common and uh, understanding of the role of an ISO in, in at, at some times. And me classifying this as at some times means I think this role might have changed um, uh, in the meantime. Um, I think that kind of, how I understand um, uh, uh, and a future ISO is what I would call, um, and this uh, term was to some degree coined by, by Brian Feit, um, as a trusted business advisor. So not so much as a bulldog trying to, uh, to, to correct what's go what goes wrong security-wise in the business world. Uh, and some of you might agree that this role hasn't performed so well in the past. Uh, so it might be time for a kind of role adjustment in the sense of, oh, I'm, I'm no more a bulldog, I'm, I, I should be, I should try to establish myself as a trusted advisor. Um, this, uh, say, adjustment of, uh, or potential adjustment of the role of an, of an ISO uh, is, um, I mean, there is elements coming in which make this adjustment uh, maybe even harder, that is the world is getting ever more complex. Uh, there is uh, stuff like outsourcing, uh, which uh, adds uh, some, say, contractual complexity. Think about uh, Brian's stuff yesterday. There is new technology showing up, heavily uh, changing the picture of how security, uh, or heavily affecting, say, the overall picture of security, like virtualization. And uh, 
there are limited resources and it has always been like that with limited resources and it will believe me ever be so um, this adds some spice to the challenge as an ISO might face anyway and uh, there is the heritage of being uh, say despised in your own organization for a long time it's not like the ISO is the most valued and most loved person within the organization uh, to say it uh, cautiously um, so there is challenges and these challenges have to be faced and it's um, not even easy to face them given the, the role uh, and the, the image that business might have of an, of an ISO. Uh, what I think um, makes uh, some elements of the job of an ISO uh, is, a, is a certain persistence. So if you, if you don't have, uh, if, if you're not a persistent type of guy, uh, you might not be qualified to be an ISO. Um, it's a job that uh, uh, requires um, uh, constantly going into battles, and battles that uh, uh, quite a number of them might get lost to some degree. So um, having some persistence helps. It absolutely helps to understand the business. Uh, that is uh, what I think a key requirement for modernizers. The bulldog at the time, obviously, um, given he was part of an organization, um, had maybe to dispose of some knowledge of the business, but it was, um, at the time, it was uh, not regarded a, a key qualification for being a good ISO, uh, but it was regarded like, okay, this one has to be... Uh, uh, somebody who knows about security and who t carries the banner of security and thereby balances out the stuff. Um, I think uh, knowing how business works and then trying, I mean, um, again, this is uh, not that new, but um, uh, trying to, to align business and um, security. Uh, this is um, what uh, uh, is an element elementary part of an ISIS life and uh, again this is uh, not that new so far for you um, and uh, yeah uh, th this is one of the movies by the way um, uh, who, uh, who recognizes which movie is that yeah taxi driver uh, and there is that famous scene um, I mean there's many famous scenes in taxi driver but uh, uh, some of you might know this um, uh, he's kind of uh, uh, what's his name in the movie? Um, uh, Travis. Um, uh, Travis is uh, kind of preparing for his mission, for his job, going out to save the world. And he talks to a mirror. Uh, that's a very famous scene. And he, he's there with a crazy expression in his face, like talking to me uh, with the mirror. Uh, have a look at YouTube. You, you will find that, that one. Um, and he goes, he, he's on a mission, and he kind of goes postal over this mission. And, uh, yeah, this might happen to an ISO as well, um, but uh, uh, take, uh, more seriously, I think there are three pieces I'd like to, uh, to bring on the table today. That is, uh, say, technology and technological changes, uh, communication and tools, and, um, uh, say, mindset, um, mental attitude of an, of an ISO towards... Um, his mission and t his job. Um, as for technology, again, this is a loose collection of thoughts. There is no very strict uh, structure um, in it. I'd, I'd like to mention three things I see going on, or th three things I regard as um, maybe important for an ISO to understand. Uh, that is what I call the house of security. Uh, that is a changing, a changing threat landscape and the evaporation of network-based controls. I gave uh, some of uh, those of you who have um, seen my uh, Troopers keynote of last year uh, will uh, recognize some slides that have been used um, before. This is one of those. Uh, this is what we call the house of security. Um, think about it. There's an ISO uh, sitting on his, um, on his desk and uh, there was uh, like security controls uh, like uh, uh, firewalls and antivirus and policies and uh, maybe some processors and uh, one of the 
say, approach us to, uh, to, to rate their own work or to understand the own work could be like classify all the, all the elements, all the instruments contributing to security. And this classification can be done in two major ways. Uh, the first that I'm not going to tackle is the one um, preventative stuff, uh, detection stuff, and reaction stuff. Um, and usually I, uh, money spent on prevention is better than money spent on detection reaction. But um, that left besides another approach of classifying all the components, where components not uh, just mean in products or technical pieces, but processes as well or guidelines. Um, all the pieces contributing sec to security can be um, in, within some classification scheme being broken down, broken down to components firewalls, anti-virus, whatever, stuff that you buy, products. Uh, second, uh, what I call implementation. How does stuff buy something, put it into your environment, uh, and hoping it uh, to somehow to contribute to uh, um, security, and operations, how you operate the stuff within your environment. And from those three, say, pillars, at the, in the end of the day, all these will help to, uh, to get uh, some security. Um, and implementation can even be split into, um, say, two pieces like design and architecture uh, and configuration. How you assemble the pieces, pro maybe products coming in, boxes, uh, how your network is built, how these pieces are brought into the network, and uh, how those pieces are configured. From these p three pillars, um, or to, to maintain them, there are resources needed. Uh, usually for, for components, it's money. For uh, this uh, type of uh, stuff, it's um, uh, FTEs. Unfortunately, it uh, looks like this. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to deliver as a message from this slide is usually organizations to some degree focus on one of the, uh, say, three pillars. Uh, in the US, there is a strong, uh, there is that so called best of breed approach. Large US organizations uh, look at a Gartner report uh, who's in the magic quadrant. Uh, oh, we have a security problem to solve. Buy this. Uh, get one of the free vendors in uh, that are in Gartner's magic quadrant. Uh, let them pay for a five-course uh, dinner with a ship cruise and um, then decide on where to spend uh, a huge amount of money um, uh, for, for some components uh, plus associated uh, maintenance uh, contracts. Uh, not sure if this works out. There is uh, other organizations which uh, put a very strong uh, perspective on, um, say, this one, uh, where you have to, uh, say, undergo um, uh, four uh, forms to be filled out uh, and some uh, background checks and whatever uh, to get access to a system, and then this access is uh, implemented by Telnet. Uh, but uh, still they think they are secure as uh, they have a strong element of um, what they call or would call operational security. Understanding that there are three pillars, trying to figure out, okay, in my organization, we mentally focus on this one or that one or this one, uh, might help to get a better understanding of uh, how security works in the uh, own organization. In general, as a Rule of thumb, spending resources here. A uh, euro or a, a man hour spent here, usually, rule of thumb, your mileage might vary, um, contributes more to security than uh, uh, a unit spent here. Again, rule of thumb. Um, but uh, think about it. Uh, just uh, spending money here or bringing um, uh, I mean, this is where quite some amount um, of uh, FTEs are spent on. 
uh, it's good to uh, have security in this space, but um, in the end of the day, uh, here in W, we perform a lot of uh, security assessments. The security, say, holds the findings we stumble across usually are located in this space. It's not like uh, there are uh, good firewalls in place. It's not like they have been configured correctly when uh, they went into operation 12 months ago. But today, uh, rule number th 387 is a, a kind of uh, allow any any for certain net network segments. And uh, this means the resources were not spent in the, in the right place. Uh, so this house of security might be uh, uh, some approach to get an idea how security is um, uh, strived for in the own organization. The uh, second thing, again citing from my last year's keynote, is this one, um, uh, the, the changing threat landscape. Uh, in the older days, to some degree, malicious code got on systems uh, by, say, worms, by missing patches. Uh, this has changed to a large degree, and this is absolutely no, um, nothing new I'm telling you here. Uh, what happens in the meantime is, to some degree, the user is... Uh, uh, involved and um, uh, the user performs uh, lots of functions with, by means of a browser or a mail client and this browser has uh, all kinds of additional functionalities uh, and uh, looking at say um, of a hundred security incidents currently in a sufficiently large organization I'd say 75, 80, maybe 85 percent. Uh, Brian, I'm, I'm not sure what your um, perception is. Uh, I would uh, put them into this, uh, into this space. Uh, so this is the space. Remember, limited resources, limited resources and free pillars, and uh, a mission to make the world a secure, a more secure place, uh, the world of your organization. Uh, this definitely is uh, the stuff you have to focus on currently as for technologies. Um, if uh, I'm, every once uh, in some weeks I have a discussion about uh, this um, uh, and uh, I use a term like, oh, if a, uh, if a fairy, uh, a godmother fairy turned around and I had three wishes, disabling X, Y, uh, would be one of my wishes. Usually I get asked, okay, what's the other two? Um, overall, I mainly choose three out of, uh, of, out of a set of five, within a, say, depending on whom I speak to. But those five, uh, I'll name them at some point within the, uh, during the presentation, um, pretty much stay the same. And, and one of those is uh, uh, disabling JavaScript and Acrobat Reader which has to be, I think I, earlier I mentioned, think about a business. It has to be aligned with the business. Uh, I'm currently, I'm in the technological space. If that ferry turned up and I had some wishes in the technological space, like um, to uh, increase the level of security, disabling JavaScript would be, uh, is, is one of those. Uh, getting rid of Windows GDI is another one. Nobody needs that. That has been um, there for uh, 10 years ago for Windows printing. In the days of Postscript printing, nobody need, pretty much nobody needs a GDI, and GDI accounts for, uh, I'd say, six uh, severe high critical kernel level vulnerabilities in Windows since um, in the last 24 months. So there's a component sitting around nobody needs, which has uh, severe uh, security problems. Uh, so getting rid of this will immediately, I'd say, uh, increase uh, or decrease the overall uh, level of um, uh, security. Uh, enabling DEP would be another one. I mean, those, uh, uh, this stuff is from the time when I gave, uh, gave the keynote, but this stuff is recurring. I, I could have found a, a similar um, one in the in the February edition of Microsoft Patch Day and uh, Adobe this year had already so many stuff in both Reader and Flash, uh, it's, it's easy to find uh, such a piece as well. 
so I already uh, gave you three, um, uh, the other two after the talk. Uh, this is simple stuff, but um, given the current threat landscape, I'd like to, this is my personal mission, to um, deliver the message. There is, it's not about buying X, Y, Z, uh, IDS, IPS, uh, or, uh, DEP or whatever kind of in the product space. It's simple things that can greatly uh, increase security and uh, these are some of those. Uh, third point in the technology spaces. Uh, there is what I'd call a evaporation of network-based controls. In times of uh, convergence, stuff um, growing together, of a virtualization, of maybe pu putting things into the cloud, uh, the traditional approach of network segmentation, of filtering at, at uh, say, network um, uh, borders, uh, this, uh, this approach, which I have been preaching for many, many years, I'm in my, in my past, um, I'm a security guy. Um, yeah, I'm a, security, I'm a network guy. I have, a I have a background in networking. I have a background in network operations. I've been working in large carrier environments. Uh, I have been um, singing the tune of, uh, oh, you have to segment, you have to filter for many years. And I kind of do, uh, I still do. But I have to recognize that this stuff uh, in, in the currently um, growing, merging, virtualized world, um, doesn't make sense uh, too much anymore, which um, again, personally, this hurts as I'm, I'm a network guy. But what are the consequences? Um, there are other security controls that gain importance. That is uh, mostly what I call host hardening. Uh, so hardening of entities. Host doesn't, does not necessarily mean a physical host, but might always uh, as well mean a, a virtual machine. But uh, look at the entities processing data and try to increase their security level as they have nobody else to, to rely on. In the older days, one could rely on, okay, there's a firewall over there. Or I'm sitting in a, in a dedicated segment. Um, not everything can get into here. Uh, these days are over. Every piece might be responsible for the own security. And encryption uh, might play a large role. Think about the whole cloud discussion. Uh, what can you do on a network level once your data is in the cloud? Nothing. You can try to encrypt it, which brings in new problems like uh, it's not that easy to search databases that are encrypted and stuff, but um, uh, there's a, a slight shift of controls from the network level to, uh, say, system level, whatever system means uh, at, the, at the very moment. It might mean an ap application or uh, some, some, some box, um, be it virtual, be it, be it physical. So to summarize this first piece, operations is key. Take care of operations. Uh, prevention pays. Prevention means um, turn off functionalities um, that you might not need. I have um, going to this discussion so many times, and I'm a bit tired of it. Still, I uh, like the discussion, oh, you, you shouldn't have flash. And certainly, most people in the room would agree. But yeah, business needs it. Um, uh, OK, if business needs it, uh, we have to understand business. That was one of my first messages. Uh, then be there flash still whenever I have the opportunity. Uh, I tell you, the threat landscape is changing. And stuff like flash, this is dangerous stuff. If you can't get rid of it, so be it. But be aware that. If you could, could get rid of it and be just in, say, certain departments or certain parts, uh, will um, diminish the, the, the threat exposure to a large degree. Uh, second, communication and tools. Again, and for the last time now, I uh, inform you that this is a loose collection of things. Um, I just want to bring up again some, some, some ideas or some elements of what, uh, what you should those of you who are ISOs will already practice some of this stuff uh, anyway. Uh, just uh, what I think, um, given that initial moment um, for the talk, what should an ISO, today's ISO, uh, reconsider? What uh, should he or she know and uh, think of? Um, 
this is this element. Understand who has the money. I mean, this is, a, again, it's a simple thing. But uh, obviously, uh, the approach of being a bulldog within the organization doesn't work anymore. Um, I mean, you, you might uh, still approach that, uh, still follow or practice that approach, but nobody will listen to you. Business will do what business wants to do anyway. Uh, maybe you have good luck uh, in the sense you, uh, there is an, um, a governance instrument like a risk acceptance uh, that uh, uh, causes a lot of work on your desk, like, okay, that's risk. Of business asks me, oh, they have a policy of violation. Um, yeah, okay, uh, let's file a risk accept acceptance. And so every six months you have to get it out, like, oh, is it, uh, uh, is the stuff, um, say, mitigated or cured? No, no, it isn't. Okay, we, we prolong it. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, there, there might come a, a point, where you, you can't, maybe you, had, you, you can't uh, say prolong the risk acceptance this more than, say, 24 months. Uh, but then something else happens, uh, it's named a bit differently or it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it gets a signature even higher on the hierarchy level or it's, it's just paper and it's done anyway. Uh, so you have to have alleys. If you want to get your mission accomplished, you have to have alleys within the organization. And um, as simple as the sounds, my experience is um, try to understand uh, who has money, who has power, and who has money, who you might get, uh, say, into some alliance with the quality guys, um, as uh, they might have better funding than you. and. Um, somehow camouflage your mission with their mission. Uh, try to find out where to get funding for your uh, for your mission. Uh, and who have even if uh, these uh, alliances you might have not had in, uh, in the past. Um, don't go into fights you can't win. There is, face it or not, um, uh, there is fights technologies you can't inhibit. Uh, regardless how hard you try. Uh, think about blackberries. Think about what, um, yeah, maybe, uh, certainly. Uh, understand where, it's, um, uh, where it makes sense to fight and where it doesn't make sense. Um, and if, there is, uh, if it doesn't make sense, um, don't, uh, don't try. Uh, that is, this is uh, as sad as this might sound for, for the very first moment. Um, this is an advice um, I will certainly give uh, those uh, people in the, in the university course, like, okay, if you are, um, don't be naive. There will be fights you can't win. Don't spend your energy on that. Um, policies. Uh, remember that slide where I had as one of the tasks of an ISO writing policies. In quite a number of organizations, it does, uh, it's not like there's one ISO who performs lots of tasks and writes the policies uh, uh, himself. Uh, there might be divisional ISOs, there might be ISOs, uh, country ISOs, all this. And they do not write the policies. Uh, there are some, maybe some group uh, at the CSO department or uh, if things, um, are organized in a certain way, they sit somewhere in, in compliance and uh, the compliance department, whatever. Um, if you have not written them yourself, establish a line of contact to policy people. You will most probably stumble across situations, again, if you have not, not written them themselves, so you, uh, you have a policy, you know it by heart, maybe as uh, you are the ISO, uh, there is um, discussions coming up uh, if some behavior of business is aligned with policy. And then you have um, uh, stuff like um, policy mandating for strong authentication. A strong authentication for privileged access. So what does it mean? What is strong authentication? In a, uh, there are cases where this is defined within the policy. There's quite some cases where this is not defined, what this means, what, what is strong authentication. Does it necessarily mean two-factor authentication? Uh, what are those factors? 
uh, are to say different passwords um, good enough? Um, uh, R2 uh, R2 passwords to factors. Um, so if there is something in the policy like a strong location, a strong authentication for privileged access, um, you have to understand what it means, especially in the situation when you get when you are new in the job. It's not like uh, organizations not disposing of policies right now, but think of a um, 30 year old person or 35 um, who was uh, promoted to be an ISO um, or divisional ISO uh, or I mean in that uh, say space of um, 500 to 5,000 user organizations, there are still plenty of them who don't even have an ISO. But they realize they should have one, be it only for compliance reasons, and then uh, somebody from, uh, be it network security, or be it uh, uh, quality, or whoever is named uh, the ISO. Uh, so he, this person inherits a policy. Try to find out what is meant uh, if um, uh, there was clauses like this in the policy, and this happens very often. In case you write them yourself, in case you still have the Position and task of writing policies, support business. This is the most important point, even though this might sound for us as security people like, um, oh, wait, uh, we, uh, we surrender. We, we say, uh, oh, there's business. Th those are our enemies. And now that, uh, well, wait, I have to write my policies not to control them, to steer them, but to support them. Uh, believe me, I've seen so many things. Uh, Support business. You won't get out of your position as a bulldog nobody listens to uh, if you do not change your mindset to a mindset that is not um, the fight or say the, the approach of um, here's policies, here's business, and here's people behaving. And now policies come in and have a controlling impact and the words get better. This is naive. This has been an understanding of policy of, of the years uh, 2000 to 2005. This does not work. So we have to find another model. And the other model is maybe sadly, but it is what it is. Here's business. And in the end of the day, business wins. So change your mindset to one that is, OK, I understand. I'm on a fight, um, uh, on a lost position. I can still try to pursue my mission, but I must support business. And this should be, say, in the wording, in the, in the, um, the mental attitude this policy is, is, is written with, which might mean to provide some flexibility. Uh, you can still be precise, like prescribing a very, in, in, the, in the wording, um, stuff like strong authentication must be used uh, if this is feasible for the organization and if um, people can find out what does strong authentication mean and if they have a, a person, ideally you, to approach, uh, okay, we want to implement this or that um, uh, technology, uh, this uses um, a web interface, the authentication is done by um, a pin and a ton, is this good enough as for strong authentication or isn't it? Um, they should not decide this on their own. They should know who to ask, you or maybe some other department uh, within the organization, and when to ask at a certain point within the project. This is the setting you have to give. Um, trying to prescribe how the world behaves by policies doesn't work. Another thing um, when talking about um, talking about policies, uh, there is some um, business world changes as the whole world changes, and there's uh, more and more things like joint ventures, corporations, um, large corporations buying smaller ones, selling one, industry uh, corporations, all this kind of stuff. There is more and more business partners, or more and more external parties. Try, when, again, you are in a position of writing policy or adjusting policy, try always to, uh, say, reconsider this perspective. Writing whatever kind of um, policy or guidance you want to provide just looking at, oh, these are my users. 
might be short-sighted. These are your users, but uh, the next day somebody turns out, it turns out uh, there was a joint venture with um, uh, some company in the, in the Emirates, like the example I gave yesterday, and uh, uh, those persons will have access to your systems to, to some degree. Uh, to develop a new product, uh, to make a lot of money, this is what business wants. Uh, take my advice, try always to think about what is about external parties coming into my organization, or into my network. This is a perspective growing ever more important. Uh, lastly, in the say tools escape um, um, uh, tool space, uh, it's all about risk at the end of the day. Uh, so honestly, I, I already said this yesterday. I, I can't understand how any ISO or CSO can work without, uh, say, or perform his or her work efficiently without risk-based um, risk-based approach in everyday uh, decisions. Uh, so one uh, should have. Um, some instruments to rate risk, which uh, I summarize as for the second uh, section. Find the right alleys. Uh, understand when uh, your mission is lost um, uh, from the very first moment. Uh, there is um, a changing role of policies within the overall uh, implementation of security, and risk plays, plays a major role. Third part, mindset and approach. Um, this one is uh, kind of a repetition what I had earlier. Be able to take punches. Um, this is, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have, a, a, say, a, a personality, a mindset that is um, able to do so, you should, maybe ISO is not the best job um, for you uh, in the world. Um, this one is uh, more important and is to some degree associated to that angle of business. You might recall from those of you who have been present in my yesterday's talk on um, the rapid risk assessment, I mentioned that case study where we were brought in to perform the rapid risk assessment uh, in the um, heart was a soft token discussion where uh, the, the, that project, as I'd call it now, uh, argued with, uh, okay, we can f uh, save uh, three to five million uh, US dollars a year. And the security people, the bulldogs, were like, oh, wait, we can't do this. Uh, uh, this will, um, uh, the, the sky will fall, uh, and there will be malware, and uh, our, our, our corporate assets will be um, exposed. Just talking about this, you can certainly understand uh, which of those parties has my sympathy, which is, believe me, which is maybe funny, or some of you might, might find funny. I've been secu doing security since 97. I love what I do. I have a family and I'm doing some sports. But besides this, pretty much everything I do in my life has some, is related to security. I do this on an everyday level. I have been one of the bulldogs in the older times. So it's, uh, it might sound crazy seeing this person, uh, called Aaron Rye, uh, who is a security guy and having sympathy for business, arguing about cost savings and making fun of the bulldogs. Still, this is part of my personal learning curve. Uh, the bulldog approach doesn't work any longer. Um, you, you will lose some of the fights anyway. So try to adjust your mindset from uh, some action is to be taken. Hard tokens replaced by soft tokens. Oh, well, this might mean a w the world is falling, uh, the, everything will break, we will have attacks, and uh, uh, we will get out of market to a mindset it is, okay. Um, certainly, there might be some impact on the security, um, on some aspects of security. Try to find out which. This is again where, where the rapid risk assessment would come in. But um, obviously, changing something, a technology, an architecture, 
a contractual modding, a model of operating IT uh, will have advantages and disadvantages. We as security people in the past have been used to understand just uh, or to focus on the disadvantages. What can go wrong? Uh, the risk definition um, I kind of gave yesterday or that is used in InfoSec is usually uh, can cause harm. Risk is something uh, and yet where that leads to negative impact, to harm, which is completely contrary to the understanding of risk, say, natural language. Um, in, in German, we have that uh, term like ein risikofreudiger Unternehmer. Uh, risk in that case is not, is not a bad thing. It means, oh, he, he's a cool guy. He takes risks to reach some goal, to get rich, whatever. Uh, to get to the North Pole by swimming to France, how, whatever. It is a positive outcome. Try to understand that what happens might have positive outcome and might even have positive outcome on security. Getting rid of hard tokens, cer certainly, I, I'm cautious, okay, um, I'd say might increase some attack surface, but it might at the same time free a lot of uh, resources um, needed for operations so far. Uh, those of you who have been, say, in, in firewall operations uh, in a sufficiently large organization, you will know that uh, there is, um, uh, given a certain size of an organization, there is one FTE that is uh, dealing uh, every day some hours with hard tokens. Oh, it has been at the time. It, it got better, but with hard tokens, so, which got lost, which had to be replaced, which are out of sync, and all this. So a technological change might have disadvantages, but might have advantages. Try to adjust your mental attitude, not just from looking at risks, uh, things causing harm, but maybe things having positive outcome, which is perfectly uh, depicted in this, um, or described in, in this uh, a piece I took from one of the main uh, books on risk, uh, John Adams' uh, risk, uh, certainly I, I recommend reading it. Um, it's, not, it's not about infosec risk, it's about risk in general. And uh, he describes the situation of old people not leaving their houses as they might fall, fall slipping on ice, uh, which obviously reduces the risk. But still, not being able to leave the house anymore um, takes uh, quite some, say, life quality away from them. So avoiding risks uh, might mean you miss opportunities. And this is what uh, I, I, I want to depict this. This is, uh, again, try to adjust your mental attitude a bit. Um, third, at a value of trust, um, some of you already know this stuff of uh, confidence, which I describe like being able to sleep well uh, being built on two sources, that is trust and control. Um, if I want to, if I'm living in a house, uh, the, my capacity of sleeping well, of feeling cozy, warm and safe, might depend on a decision that goes like, uh, okay, there, so this is a friendly neighborhood, um, um, I'm far away of, um, bad uh, creatures and things anyway, so that I don't have to lock my door, I, I don't even need a lock at the door. Uh, then uh, this, is, this is trust. Uh, obviously, I could be paranoid, like, oh, I have to lock my house, and yeah, I need a fence, and uh, I need a, a motion sensor, and all this. Uh, these are elements of control. Both might um, contribute to the fact that I sleep well to some degree. Problem is, you can't control everything. Your resources are limited. You have to trust somewhere. You just have to figure out where to trust and where to control. And the bulldog type tends to, uh, to use controls. Oh, we have to control this. We have to bring this in. Uh, you might note um, I have a different stance to some things uh, than, for example, Pete Herzog had uh, today. Um, you have to trust somewhere. So regard trust as a good instrument. It's not just about controlling. 
uh, and monitoring and putting resources into instruments, try to understand where you can apply control and where you can apply trust. So, again, this is about a mental attitude. So, uh, there are situations where you can trust, there are situations where you can't trust, um, and you might need some controls, or at least uh, trust might not be the applicable way of handling the situation. But uh, understand this. In the end of the day, there should be confidence. Uh, confi sleeping well, not only on the personal level, but uh, saying have a climate of, um, of productivity within a given organization. And this is uh, sourced from two sources, trust and control, not just focus on this one. And this costs money, this costs operational effort. Know when to use this or try to understand it. Lessons learned, uh, mindset um, is paramount. Uh, there is risk and reward. The world is not always ending bad, and technological changes uh, have their advantages and chance, chances too. And uh, to be able to maintain a level of um, felt security, of uh, security to, for those persons who are affected, there are two sources. Uh, so, to summarize, um, uh, there might be uh, that the corporate infosec world is complex and even gets more complex every day. Uh, and it might be a battlefield for, um, for the bulldogs. Uh, still, I am optimistic that an ISO has a, has a very important role and can, given the right mindset, given the right tools, certainly uh, accomplish a mission, and this mission should not be the one of a bulldog, but of a trusted business advisor. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh by, by the way, which, uh, which movie is that? Nobody knows? Yeah, that, that, that's Scarface. That's uh, Tony Montana. Um, uh, my, um, I have, a, um, uh, currently, I have uh, two kids. Uh, a boy who's seven years old and a, and a girl who's uh, five year old. And, and the, uh, there's a very famous quote from um, Scarface that goes like, um, my name is Tony Montana. Um, I got a money and I got a J. Joe. J. Joe is uh, in, in, that, uh, in that context. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a film about drug dealing for those uh, you, you do, who know, do not know um, uh, Scarface. And um, I, I don't remember why, but I, I taught my little boy like that sentence, um, my name is Tony Montana. Uh, I got a money and I got a J. Joe. And he, he found it very funny and he, he repeated it all, all the time. Uh, my wife hated me for this. And obviously he asked her, what is the J. Joe? And I said, oh wait, this is something like sweets. Um, uh, and my wife had even, even more. Um, so uh, Scarface is uh, yeah, trusted business advisor. Uh, that should not be necessarily uh, to perform the role of uh, Tony Montana, but that should be how to understand your role as an ISO. Okay, I got it back. Um, uh, given the keynote style, I'm, I'm not sure if there was um, a need for questions. Are there any? I'm happy to discuss um, this stuff uh, uh, in the remainder of the conference. Um, uh, is anybody of you staying overnight in Heidelberg? All of you are leaving today, um, besides the speakers. Uh, I mean, there's a speaker's dinner uh, tonight. Um, if any of you wants to stay for that, uh, feel free to approach me. That can be arranged. Thanks for your attention, and um, have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>